So on Monday the 16th of October 2017, two researchers at a Belgian university released information of a crack that they had found, or rather an exploit that they had found, for the security mechanism used on all major Wi-Fi connections these days. So this is WPA, the encryption protocol that was brought in to replace the early one, WP, which was basically useless. So this one has been proven to be mathematically correct, it's been proven to be mathematically secure, and so it was thought that you wouldn't be able to attack it. And for the last 15 years or so, there's been a few sort of fringe effects that you could exploit to get certain things, but in general, it's, it's secure until yesterday. The way that WPA works is that the client, your computer, when it connects to the base station, initially starts off unencrypted, and very quickly they exchange a series of messages between the two, which get them so they've agreed a key that they're going to use to encrypt the message. And so to understand what, how this attack works, we need to understand how those messages are transmitted, and then how that's used to encrypt the data, which is why I brought Mike along to sort of help talk about the encryption side of things. Hello, Mike. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, what am I doing here? <laughs> so what I've got open on the computer here is I set Wireshark going when I turned on my Wi-Fi card and it's captured a series of packets. And what we can see here is there are four packets of information that are sent between the computer and the access point. And these effectively agree the shared key that they're going to use. Now, this isn't the password you put into your Wi-Fi router. One of the interesting things is that this attack works without ever necessarily getting hold of your password. So we end up with four messages that are being sent between the base station and your computer to establish those things. So if we have a look at them, yeah, we've got our computer here, and we have the access point here, or the base station. We've associated with it, so the first thing to set up the encryption is that the access point sends a message across, and we'll call this message one. This contains various information in there, including a random number which is used, and a counter which is used for something else, but we won't go into too much detail. And then we reply with our own random number, which is message two. This sends back message three, which contains a bit more information. And then we send message four, which basically says, yep, I got that. The communication is now established. Now, the way the crack attack works is by sitting in the middle, you have another computer, which is the one, your malicious actor which is going to sit there to try and break into this encryption and he has to sit in such a way that he can know when this one is sent and stop message four being sent back does he stop it being sent back or does it what does he do block it or something or? so yeah i mean the basic the, the basic way this works is that you need to cause message three to be received by the computer more than once in a way that you know about and that you've got access to things. And if you do that, you can then start capturing data and you can use some, some of the techniques that Mike's gonna talk about to decrypt the information. So one way you could do it is you could perhaps splat a bit of noise onto the Wi-Fi signal at that point. There are easier ways where you pretend to be a base station and quickly send a message saying, switch to me on a different channel because I've got better communications here, which means you receive it and the other base station doesn't and then it sends it out and you can sort of forward it on. So there's various ways you could probably push this into, into use. But basically, once you've got in here and you cause this to be resent, it causes parts of the values that the computer uses to encrypt the messages to be reset as well. And once you've done that, you can get into a position where you can actually start to decrypt the messages. When the client receives message three, that's the moment it thinks, right, I've got my keys now, I can store them away ready for encryption. The problem is that if the access point doesn't receive message four, it thinks, oh, well, something must have happened to it, so I'll send message three again to make sure the client got it. The bug that these researchers have found is that if message three gets resent, it restores the key. And in doing so, also resets all of the other cryptographic variables it's been working with, which is a real problem. In particular, it's a problem when you reset something called the nonce, or the number used once. So the way we usually encrypt in uh, WPA is through AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, and we do it in counter mode, generally speaking because it's quite fast. So if you think back to the video we did on XOR and uh, stream ciphers, we basically use AES as a stream cipher. So we have an ever-increasing counter, let's say it starts at one, and we encrypt these numbers with our AES block cipher. Here's our key coming in here. So this one, when encrypted using this key, will produce a block of AES encrypted data that's random. So basically we're generating here a set of random numbers that goes on like this 
from the first block and then the second and then the third and so on all the way along. But it's not a truly random thing because if I know the key and I've got, I can start yeah. one and generate the same. Yeah, and so I mean that, that unfortunately is the problem with cryptography is that we couldn't ever use truly random because we wouldn't be able to decrypt it again. We have our message bits which are you know not one one not something different, and we XOR these together one bit at a time, and that's how we encrypt. And the nice thing is to decrypt, we basically regenerate this key stream and do the exact process again. We XOR our ciphertext and get our message back out. Now, counter mode is very, very fast, and it's perfectly secure if your block cipher produces nicely random bits, unless you reuse the numbers, in which case it's completely broken. In this attack, remember, we're resetting the nonce, because we're resending message three, the client sees this and goes, oh, I better restart all my encryption from, start, from scratch again. So this number goes back to one or it goes back to zero, somewhere at the beginning. And so we're generating the exact same key stream multiple times. We start by encrypting some data using a, the key starting at one, two, three, four, and then it gets reset and we encrypt some different data with one, two, three, four. So normally it doesn't go round like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It literally just keeps It will just keep counting up and obviously the theoretical limit will be the, the uh, 128 bit number that you're trying to store. That, I mean, that's unlikely to happen in the time you're connected to the Wi-Fi, but it's a theoretical possibility. Is this as simple as if they use one multiple times, you can probably work out what... Yeah, so if you imagine that we've used one multiple times, the same key's been used because the key didn't get changed, then the same key stream of zeros and ones has been XORed with our message. Right? And that's very, very weak. When we use the same key twice, we can essentially nullify the key by XORing two messages together. And then we do a very similar process something called crib dragging. So we will come up with hypothetical bits of plain text, we think, let's say the word HTML or someone's login name or something like this, and we will slide it over the message until it, it gets a hit. And at that point, we know not only where it is, but also what the key stream bits were that, for that position were. So it's not a completely trivial process, but on a computer, it can be brute forced incredibly quickly. If you reuse the same counter twice with the same key, in something like counter mode, it's, it's such a huge problem because basically you can extract plain text bits from multiple messages. Once you've started to do that, then you've got some idea of what was sent. You might be able to predict what they're going to send and sort of get in and start put, doing replay attacks and things like this, or injecting information in. But we've done all this without even knowing what the key was. So it, it's an interesting part of encryption where um, you aren't necessarily secure just because the key is secret. Right? And in this case, very much not the case. Um, the other issue is that some of these modes, you can extract the authentication key as well. So when we talked about HMAC, we had a secret key that we used to make sure the message hadn't been interfered with. Well, if we can find that key, which you can using this attack, then you can start to forge your own messages, start to, let's say, add in TCP packets of HTML that conveniently hold some JavaScript that runs some ransomware, for example, and then you know, you're, in, you're in business. And we've done that without knowing what the key is. One question. What would happen if this key was zero here, when we're generating this counter? What would happen if the key was zero? If the key is zero, then you're encrypting one with zeros. It will still produce a random output, but it will produce a random output that's always the same, and we will know what it is. So we could, we could guess the key stream and, and decrypt the message. And if we knew where we were in the key stream, we could generate the right values, generate the right packets. The way this um, plays out is on certain operating systems, it basically has no effect. So Windows, iOS, it seems, because of the way they follow or don't quite follow the standard, it seems that this has limited effect. There are still ways you can attack things, but it's, it has limited effect. So, so you're saying people on Windows laptops and, and on iOS devices should be all right, is that...? They're, they're safer than other devices. The problem comes with um, the, the program that does it in Linux and on certain Android phones. So the implementation used on Linux and Android that clears the key out of memory, which is a good thing to do, because if you're sitting in a coffee shop and you go off to buy a coffee, it's not impossible to plug a device quickly, a Thunderbolt device to do it into the side of the machine and copy the um, a bit of memory out of there, which has perhaps got the key in it, and then we can decrypt your traffic. So that makes sense. The problem is that when you replay message three, which you need to do to make the attack work, that also resets the count of the things that Mike's talked about, and it now uses the key, which is zero, to start encrypting these things. So actually you end up with a known sequence of counters being generated, which means that you can then, as well as decrypt the messages, you can sort of insert data into that message stream and start sending things to you 
that you perhaps weren't expecting to get. So on certain operating systems, it's relatively benign. On others, it's more dangerous. But it's also worth remembering that we should still use WPA2 to encrypt things because the alternative is that you have no security. And that even if someone does come and do this, they could do exactly the same by unplugging your base station and plugging it another device into the ethernet the other side of that and listen there anyway. So it's, it's a risk, it needs to be patched, it'll be patched, and then we can all go back to using Wi-Fi and browsing the web. These leaks happen all the time, and so passwords are being just dumped out onto the internet all the time. So there's this password list called RockU, uh, which is uh, a bit of a game changer in password cracking, if that's a thing, right? Um, 50. But this is the IBM PC XT, the model 5160, which came out two years later in 1983. So this is really what the first PC was like.